Now, this is how our energy landscape looks now, pretty much, with the country mainly running on a mix of coal, gas, oil and nuclear power stations. But if the recommendations are accepted by government in just a few decades' time, the UK will look very different with wind turbines, solar panels and other renewable sources, more nuclear and clean coal power stations. So let's fast forward 40 years to see what our low-carbon future might look like. It's 2050 and Britain's energy future is looking rosy. Emissions reduction targets put in place back in 2008 mean we're now a world leader in renewable technology. And of course, energy saving all started at home. Yes, not long after the 2008 climate change bill was enforced, the government authorised grants to install loft and cavity wall insulation in our existing homes. Of course, switching off appliances and cutting electricity use also made a big difference. And home wind turbines and solar panels were the icing on the cake of our new decentralised power supply. Yes, by 2050, life might be like this if our low carbon journey starts now. But we need to see a cut of carbon dioxide emissions by 3 to 4% each year. It's perfectly achievable if the government really pulls its finger out and brings forward some good policies to reduce emissions. And it's not just home life that must change. By the middle of the century, the Climate Committee says old-fashioned gas guzzlers and petrol cars must be an unwelcome memory, with everyone running on electric, or perhaps hydrogen fuel cells. Public transport will need a boost too, perhaps with a new high-speed north-south rail link, which would also cut short-haul flights. Talking of which, the committee today recommended that aviation and shipping emissions are ultimately included in the UK's reduction target. But how easily achievable is this decarbonised utopia? Can we do it? Of course. We're the fifth most powerful country in the world. We actually have an income of £1.4 trillion every year. Of course we can afford to change. We can afford to actually change our whole society into a much lower carbon diet. Back to reality, where the UK's latest annual emissions cut was only 0.5%. For now anyway, then, a decarbonised Britain seems some way off. Well, the committee also recommends that the 2050 target should include aviation and shipping emissions. But of course, they will make the goal less achievable. And it's unlikely they will be included in the short term anyway. And the climate change bill is due to become law in December. So the hard work, it seems, starts now. It's uh, important now that the government can recognise the urgency of tackling climate change. Otherwise, if we don't go for these kind of emissions cuts, there's a real danger we'll tip into catastrophic climate change where we really can't stop it. And then we can see temperature increases of four, five, six degrees by the end of the century. And that has real issues for humanity on this planet. I appreciate that you would say it's the right figure. People would, under, would expect you to say that. But given that this includes aviation and shipping, I mean, that's where it gets really interesting, isn't it? I mean, just how realistic is that? The, the, the issue with climate change, of course, is that the science comes first, and this is the scientific figure. So the question of realist, uh, realism or not doesn't really come into it. This is the figure that we have to meet if we're going to do it. And it's really important, and we're very much welcome, that they have included aviation and shipping. Yes, it is going to be tough. There's no question about that. But what this announcement means is that plans for the expansion of Heathrow Airport, plans for expansion of other airports around the country, plans for unabated coal-fired power stations, which have been on the cards in the, in the government, uh, are now impossible. There's no way that the government can go ahead with these plans if they're going to stand any chance of meeting these targets. Indeed, but you will know that the argument is, uh, unless there's going to be global agreements on this, really, not, not what use is it Britain doing something, but, you know, it severely diminishes our impact if, if other countries are continuing to pollute hugely. Sure, this does need to be part of a global deal. And I think it's important that as we go into the negotiations on the global deal in Poznan later this year and then Copenhagen, it's important that we go in with a, a strong commitment to the kind of emissions levels that uh, are going to be required from the developed world and the developing world. But I think, you know, we have to, there's a lot of myths about the developing world on this. Actually, if you look at China's renewable energy plans, if you look at the way they are treating climate change as an issue right now, you'd be surprised at how aggressive they are being. So there's no reason why we shouldn't be aggressive in this country as well.
So you have a degree of confidence that, that we could get there as a nation, that, that, that I mean that, that politically the will is there? Absolutely. I mean, Lord Turner is one of this country's most respected business people. He's also going to be heading up the Financial Services Authority, which, you know, following all the news we've had about the credit crunches, is a very business-focused uh, appointment. Here is a man who understands the point about competitiveness and understands what our economy needs to look like in 30, 40, 50 years' time. And he's saying that we can make these kind of emissions reductions. That's really important. Bennett Northcote from Greenpeace, thanks very much for joining us. Thank you.